kids. Before I uh, get started, um, during our Revelation Bible study, we had uh, a chance to hear a praise report from Art and John, and so I just asked Art to go ahead and share. So if Art, if you could come up and just share the, the praise report that you had, that was, it was pretty amazing. God, God is working in our midst. Good morning. Uh, if you don't know John Wilson, he's a good friend of mine. You're seated over here. Uh, just the other day, we had a uh, privilege to experience God's Word in action. For a number of years, we had a close friend that we golfed with numerous times for years, bowling. He's a small, short guy who's of not many words, uh, a real quiet guy. So we never had occasion to speak about the Lord or about his faith or where he was at. And uh, he's about 82 at the time when he got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And during the uh, check for that, they decided to, that he was completely clogged on one side and about 90% on the other. As it, as it turned out, the doctor sent him home and told him, if it happens again, don't bring him back. So uh, the nurses came over and said, don't. If he's in trouble, you, you bring him in. And that did happen. And when he came in, it was just beyond repair. They said, uh, we could go through the surgery, but likely wouldn't help. So John and I spoke about it at our bowling league, and I said, you know, I'm not going to let this guy leave this earth and not say anything. So we had occasion to go over there and prayed with him. And I shared with them, uh, I think it's in Romans 10, 13. It's in other places as well. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I said, Mike, if you really get afraid or you, you, you just don't know what's going to happen, you talk to him. He, he's there for you. He loves you. Anyway, to make a long story short, he had another bout, ended up in the hospital, and uh, he succumbed to, uh, to the... Uh, the clogging and, and the Alzheimer's, and he passed away. Just the other day, I spoke with his wife, and when before that happened, she had said to him, hey, Mike, uh, I guess this is the end. He responded, he says, no, this is the beginning. And I was just so jazzed with that, and I think, yeah, you probably are too. So that's my story. <laughs> Yeah, God is at work. Um, no matter how down we get about the worldly stuff going on, or, or maybe even the personal struggles that we have, um, just remember, you know, that's what the church is about, sharing those stories that, that God is at work in our lives, and, and He's here to remind us to keep going, to keep pressing, and, and it's not over yet, you know. Uh, we may have one year here, we may have one day here, we may have... 20 or 30 years left. We don't know. Uh, so just keep pressing on and, and keep moving forward in the faith. That's, that's what it's all about. Um, let's see. Oh, what happened? Oh, never mind. I got it. <laughs> Evidently, I cured it. There we go. Um, mm, 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 mm. There are interesting things happening with, uh, with John, so I, I thank you, you know, with the, the wedding and everything. I will be here um, until Friday morning. So if you, if you just want to drop a card by, those of you that know John, just want to drop a card by, uh, I'll stop by the, the church office on Friday morning and pick everything up to take with us on the plane because we leave out on Friday. So, uh, so thank you from him. And uh, I, I think I already sent some of you the, the link. It's a Weebly. It says, I think it's called Where the Wild Munions Are. So evidently they've, they, they've named themselves the Wild Munion, part of the clan. So, uh, but that's, that's the web address for everything. So. But I sent that to, uh, to Melissa, and you can get that from her, the exact address. Um, so to start again, like always, um, you know, eventually, if I do this enough, you'll memorize these verses, right? That's, that's kind of the subliminal there. Um, when you go to speak to people, uh, I'm, I'm always nervous, you know? I'm always like, 
shaking. Uh, even when kids come into my room, if I'm talking about social studies or English, I don't get nervous. But when kids come in my room and ask me about God, I get nervous because I'm saying, thus saith the Lord. And that should make you nervous. Um, and so it's with, with fear and trembling that I truly do speak to you guys, um, not because I'm nervous of what you're going to think of me, but because I don't want to disappoint our Heavenly Father. Um, so know that this, this is meant only so that your faith will rest on the power of God. That's what I want, and that's what I pray every time uh, when I'm preparing. Um, I forgot. Uh, Steve, can you grab those two books? Bring those up here, please. I was going to bring these up with me. Um, so I've I've given no, I've given you a little taste. I don't think that's going to hold it. Ugh. Nope, not going to hold it. I've given you a little taste uh, before of all the Greek words that I go through, the machinations. Um, and I'm showing you this just to show you the, the, the vast knowledge, storehouse, riches. Um, these are the things I look up for fun. <laughs> and uh, I had a, a student uh, was asking me the other day, she says, how do you know so much? And I said, well, do you watch TV? She said, yeah. I said, well, I probably watch TV almost as much as you, but I also make sure I read as much as I watch TV. So if I watch TV for an hour, I read for an hour, right? It's like, no way, I can't do it. I've been doing that since I was like six or seven years old. Um, so when, when I do my research, and the reason why I'm, I'm telling you all this is I'm, there's, there's several ways to do your research. Um, I look at the Greek words, and I, I only study what those words mean in the context in which it was delivered. So you kind of have to put on your first and second century Roman hat or your first and second century Greek hat when you go into this. A mime, that's what uh, today's all about, miming into maturity. Well, a mime didn't exactly mean what it means today. It, it wasn't that blank wall, right, or, or the tug of war. right? It's a different kind of mime. We are to mime or mimic Christ into maturity. That's what we're doing. That's what it's talking about with this word imitate in Ephesians 5. So we all mimic. We mimic all kinds of things, don't we? When you get to work, you have to mimic what your boss tells you is important or you lose your job, <laughs> right? I remember being in a, in a class in college, and uh, they're like, oh, this is the hardest philosophy professor in the department, and, and you just have to tell him what he wants to hear. And I'm like, I ain't doing that. So I got to see. <laughs> like, I got A's in my English classes and A's in all my other classes that had to do with writing because I was a pretty proficient writer. But in his class, I got C's because I wasn't about to tell him just what he wanted to hear. Right? And I, actually, there were about 20 or 30 of us Christians one semester that all took one of his classes on purpose <laughs> just so we could write for the Christian perspective because he was an avowed atheist. Um, and, and he got a good double dose, triple dose, quadruple, what, 10 times dose of Christian responses to philosophy. Um, so we mimic, we mimic God in order to draw closer to God, Right? Jesus told us to do that. He said, I'm mimicking my father, and I want you to mimic me. They said, oh, how do we do that? He's like, you don't know? <laughs> you didn't follow me for all this time? Look at my works. What is my fruit? Mimic me as I mimic my father. And then it became even more real when he died on the cross. And that's when it came home to the disciples. They're like, whoa, I got to die? Yeah. I mean, imagine 
remembering Jesus saying, indeed, you are going to drink the same cup as me. I'm going to be crucified? Yeah, yeah, you are. So mimicking Jesus is not easy. If it were, everyone would do it, right? <laughs> if, if it were, the path wouldn't have been described as narrow. Everybody would be able to find it if the path were wide. It would include everybody. But, big, 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 but, he's shown us the way. He told us we could do it, therefore it can be done. That's what I love about the Bible, because it says what you can do. It does give you some lists about what you shouldn't be doing, but it tells you you can do this. I can raise a person from the dead. Yep. He said it's possible. I don't know how. I don't know when, if I'll ever be called upon to do that. But that's what he said. He said, greater things than these will you do. I know I've rescued some dead hearts. <laughs> I've certainly inspired some people, right? Uh, we were talking in our uh, Revelation Bible study, is the lake of fire going to be an actual lake of fire? It says it's there, physically. But there's also other references to fire that say that there's a different kind of fire too. And we know that separation from God is the worst kind of torture there is. And that's going to include the lake of fire. So setting hearts on fire, we can do that. Because God told us we could. And we have a different hope than everybody else. Our hope isn't in this world. Our hope is ahead of us because Christ is ahead of us. He's preparing that place for us now. We can be confident in that. if we follow the directions he left us. Now, going to Reno. How do you get to Reno? <laughs> you go that way. Yeah. How would you get to, I had to do this assignment, how would you get from Elko to Las Vegas not using the 80? Can you tell me that one? <laughs> there's, there's some turns though, aren't there? And you kind of need to know some road signs. That's what the Bible is. The road signs. The directions for how to do that. So Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, it starts out, oh, I do have, uh, I don't have any notes, but if you would like to take some notes on the verses, we have those. Um, because I'm just going to go through the verses, just going to go through the verses. <laughs> I'm going through the verses, it evolves. There's not a whole lot of other like little wisdom nuggets in there. There are a couple here and there, but it, it's not much. So, so feel free to write, uh, write little nuggets down in the, the verses and go look them up. I love it teaching this Revelation class because they always come back with questions. So I love your questions. Bring up those questions, please. So verses five, one and, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitators is that word, mime. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So when we imitate Christ, we are described as being a fra fragrant aroma just like all that long list of people in the Hebrews Hall of Faith. We're compared to Abraham. Abraham was a fragrant aroma to God. That's me. I'm a fragrant aroma. Not after I work out, but <laughs> right? we're fragrant aromas when we do the work of Christ, when we follow, when we imitate Christ. When we use the gifts God has given us, it's just as pleasing as anybody named in the Old Testament or New Testament. We're right there. We are a fellow brother with Christ. So therefore, this is, this is the, the Greek rendering. When I, when I pointed, the, that's what I did. I, I looked up all the Greek words and, and, and 
use their explanation. Um, so therefore, with, this, with all this being said, all this above that, that Jay went through and Steve went through up above, how do we move forward? We imitate our Father God by giving the gift of grace, love, and forgiveness to others as he has given it to us as his children. We are to make our way on the path of Christ by loving others as Christ loved us through his sacrifice. Our sacrifice is to be using what we have to further his kingdom. When we use the gifts God has given us, it is just as pleasing as any of the great heroes. So do you have a car? Is that car being used for God's kingdom? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable, but yeah. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, I need a truck. All right, let's go. I'm using what God has given me for the kingdom. And that goes for my other gifts as well. Right? I know technology, and so I've given that gift to God. If the Holy Spirit speaks to me and tells me, hey, I got this whole project I need you to set up. All right. Let's go do it. God's given me the, te- the gift of teaching. That's why I'm up here, <laughs> right? Because God gave me a gift, and he told me then to use it. Now, I wouldn't be up here using that gift if God didn't tell me. That's the other key. If it's not God, there's not going to be any fruit. It's just going to be a dead work. It must be of God. As I was going through this chapter, it reminded me of uh, Jeremiah um, and the new covenant that he promised us. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, reminding us of his faithfulness. But... But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after these days, those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So we won't have to go look up the verses anymore, because he's given us the Spirit and written the law on our heart. What law? What law is it? My teacher side coming out. What's the law we're supposed to follow? The law of what? Starts with an L. The law of love. Yeah. The law of love is written on our hearts and supersedes anything in the Torah. Anything in Numbers, anything in Deuteronomy, anything in Exodus, anything, anything in the prophets, anything in Psalms, Proverbs. The law of love supersedes everything. Because no matter what, If you do it out of love, God's got you covered. You're solid. You're golden, right? You're good if you do it out of love. And here's the big one, right? This this is, I love this. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. So if both of these sets of verses are true, if in the first place we have that perfect example, Christ, and we can mimic Christ, mimic Christ's example for us, and that'll get us in the kingdom, and if we also have this new covenant, what's the Bible for? Why do we have a church? There's a big one. Why am I up here? (laughs) Right? I was like, hey, I don't even need to be here. Thanks, guys. Mic drop. See you guys later. That's it. Sermon for the day is over. So why would God then set this whole system up? Well, because we do need encouragement. Because as humans, we do fall down. We do need to be reminded. We do need to be spurred on to good works. We do need people around us. We're social animals. That's why social media is so popular. 
We can't help ourselves but try to consume some of it. It draws us, the social side draws us into communion with each other. That's also the draw that draws us into the communion with God. Right? You've all heard the saying, a God-sized hole in your heart. That's because we are beings of communion. We want to commune with each other, and we want to commune with God. So here's a uh, little blast from the past. Number 71 right there in the center. Yeah, got my mean face on. That was uh, seventh grade football and in Wellington, Texas. And if you know anything about Texas, football is king and queen and all the princes and princesses. Football's everything. Football is life. So I show up in Texas. I, I, I was fast, right? I'd always been fast. And, and so the, the, the football coach recognized, you know, saw that in me and, and, and said, come on out, we, we need you on the football team. And uh, so I went out, but I didn't have hands. Couldn't really catch. And I hadn't been playing Pop Warner or Pee Wee League or anything like that, so, so I didn't really have the plays memorized. So the offense was kind of off limits for me, in his mind probably. I could see why. Uh, so he put me as cornerback because that's where you put your fast guy to cover the receivers, right? And so, you know, we go through these drills, and, and I learn, you know, the, the look, and, look at the quarterback and keep one eye on the receiver so that, so that I know what the play is going to be, running or, or, or pass play. And, and so I, I look to the linebacker, and the linebacker is supposed to give me a signal too. And, and there's all this stuff I'm learning, right? And I'm like, yeah, I can do this. And then we get to scrimmage day. Right? like a weekend, our first scrimmage with the offense, defense versus offense. And Shorty, number 40 right there, um, probably the one person that was shorter than me on the team, uh, he's also the coach's son, uh, Shorty was, and uh, didn't, didn't think about that at the time, and you'll see why it's important in a minute. <laughs> because Shorty had this, this, well, he knew more than I did. Right? He's on the offense, so he knows whether it's going to be a running play or a pass play. He also knew they're not going to pass to him, but maybe once or twice a game because we had a run-heavy offense. So he would duck his head down and just run at me and boom, hit me right in the chest. Every play. Like, what gives, Shorty? Come on. It's like, that's what I'm supposed to do. Just take it. You got to like it because I'm going to give it. You know, he, was just, he was just mean and ornery. And so after two days of this, two days of scrimmaging, my brother, he's, he was a big football star on the football team. And uh, he had like three sacks a game. And he was just a monster. So I said, hey, can you tell me what to do to Shorty to get him to stop hitting me in the chest? So frustrated. He said, yeah. He said, you need to recognize when he puts his head down that he can't see you. Recognize that, that he's blind when he puts his head down. You step to the side, you put two fingers in the back of his helmet, throw him to the ground, he'll never do it again. And he didn't. Because I got benched. <laughs> that's, the, that's the head coach's son. <laughs> he went off on me. Don't you know you could kill a kid? Don't you know? He was mad. He was so mad. And I didn't play the rest of the season. Except for the last game, the last quarter, I was put in as nose tackle. Anybody know what nose tackle is? That's the middle of the defensive line. So when the offensive line collapses and pushes everybody out of the way for the running back to go through, they fall on the nose tackle. So I was at the bottom of the pile for an entire quarter over and over again. But hey, I got to play. But we have to recognize the play, right? We have to recognize when things are coming our way. Happening, be aware, and then know what to do. That's what the Bible's for. That's what the church is for. That's what these sermons are for. That's why we meet on Sundays. To be encouraged, to be instructed, to be told, to be reminded, to be lifted up. 1 Corinthians, whoops, wrong way. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, 14, 11 through 14. Now these things happened to them as an example. Oh, that's how we're going to recognize. Because we have these examples to look to to say, hey, look, there could be some problems if you got two twins in the family. Well, there's these two twins, Jacob and Esau, right? There's some examples we learn from their lives. 
and on and on and on, all the different stories of the Bible. There's also examples you learn from my life. When I get up here, I don't just tell you stories just to tell you stories. The Holy Spirit is urging me to tell these stories. Who wants to be embarrassed by <laughs> telling everybody you got bitch for the entire season, <laughs> right? Kind of embarrassing. I don't do it to make myself look good, obviously. It's so you learn from the example. And they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. So if you're being tempted, you've got other men and women around you that can help you, that can say, hey, I've been there, I know, I know the pain, I know the sorrow, I know the problems it's caused. Let me help you. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So God's not going to give you more than you can handle. I had a teacher, math science teacher, in this, the, the classroom next door. Uh, he lived out in Fernley. It was a long drive, and uh, so he just decided after a year, it's, he's done. And he got a job teaching at the local school out in Fernley. Didn't want to drive anymore. And so now, on top of anything else I have in my life going on, which isn't much, I'm the math science teacher. <laughs> yes! And this verse came to me immediately. God's not going to give me more than I can take. He's not going to put me under more pressure than I can handle. He put me in this situation. And he's going to be the one that gets me out of it. In whatever manner, whatever way. I don't know how it's going to happen. But I'm busy right now. Woo! <laughs> Very busy. That's okay. One step at a time. That's what I keep telling myself. Some days I wake up and I say, all right, one step at a time. I got 50 things on my calendar to do. What do I got to do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? The most important verse in the whole Bible is verse 14. Therefore, flee idolatry. Flee idols. Well, that begs the question then, what are idols? <laughs> What's idolatry? Idololatria. Russ, I thought you said there wasn't going to be any Greek today. I didn't say that. I implied it. So we've got the difference set up also in these verses in Ephesians because it has the same word, idololatria, set opposite of mimetes. Mimetes is to be a follower. If I'm a follower, I'm mimicking the person I'm following. Can you, can you mimic a totem pole? <laughs> Let's mimic totem poles. <laughs> That's mimicking a totem pole, right? You can't mimic, you can't follow an idol. Well, what do you do that makes you an idolater? What do you do to idols, to those totem poles? Well, you service them. You give service to them. And a lot of it looks like Christianity, if you think about it. You bring other followers. Oh, that's interesting. You bring sacrifices. That's interesting. You sing to them. That sounds like church. So could you be a Christian and be an idolater? Yeah. Yeah. Some people have turned Christ into an idol. Paul said so in Philippians. He says some people preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Oh, they've turned Christ into something selfish. Yeah, may it never be. He says whether they preach out of selfish ambition or out of pure motives, it doesn't matter to me as long as Christ is preached. Preach Christ and Christ alone. 
to be sure, though. So to be a follower is different than servicing idols. Just coming to church, that's making the church an idol. I'm not going to die for this building, <laughs> right? I wouldn't put myself out there to die for Pine Nut Road, Crossroads Nazarene. I would put myself on the line for Jesus Christ. I would suffer for Jesus Christ. And I do, in small ways. I haven't suffered yet unto blood, and that's what keeps me going. Like, all right, I still got one more. Jesus said, there's one thing. Being crucified on a cross, you haven't done yet. And if you haven't done that, keep going. Because the moment I cross over, then I'm done and I can rest. Until then, I got work to do. I receive orders. So these visual representations, in whatever way they come up, don't fall into that trap. That's what this chapter is all about. Don't fall into the trap of making up little rules of saying, well, it's just my boundaries. What? The Holy Spirit has no boundaries. Now, if the Holy Spirit tells you to have a boundary with a person, you probably better put a boundary up with that person. But we don't just read books written by Christian authors and then take it as gospel. We have to communicate, be in communion with the Holy Spirit about any kind of wisdom. I read lots of psychology. I read lots of politics. I read lots of all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and I use both a lot. Because I do need to know some things, but I don't need to hear all the rest of it. So these visual representations, they're okay, but they have to be accompanied by the love of Christ for us to truly be called a follower, a mimetes. Colossians 3.5, once again, we see it, idolatria, it's the opposite of copying Christ, being a follower. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Just be dead. If there's something that you're attracted to, don't move. Don't breathe until it goes away. That's what that means. Stand firm. Just don't move into it. God will provide a rescue. Wait for the cavalry. He's coming. And if you're wondering where it's at, maybe he's already told you, so look, look back in your mind. What did he tell me? Maybe I do know a verse for this. See, when Jesus was tempted, what did he have? He had three answers, one for each time the devil tried to tempt him. Oh, that means he was ready. That means he was in the Word. That's, that means he knew his stuff. Art came up with a great question today. I'm like, all right. Whew. Let's put our brain on. Let's get through this one. I didn't see it as a challenge to me, to my pride. I saw it as a challenge of something to figure out more about Christ. And that's how we should be challenging each other. Iron sharpening iron. Do you know how to answer your greatest temptations? Do you have something set up? Do you have a plan? When Shorty ducks his head and runs at you, you got a plan. My mistake was hooking the helmet. Don't do that. Step aside. Get out of the way. Yeah, I had a plan. I had the wrong plan. Had to be tweaked a little bit. But do you have a plan for your greatest temptations? Your greatest distractions? Is there a plan there? Now, that's not to say that every little thing we have to analyze and say, oh my goodness, I watched... 25 minutes of TV. Well, no. Was God telling you to prepare the message when you were watching TV? Is that what was? Oh, then, then you might need to turn the TV off. Was God telling you to go talk to your neighbor and instead you wanted to go play on the lake with your boat or whatever? You wanted to go shooting your guns. And the Holy Spirit had already spoken to you and saying, no, I need you at this place at this time. Come on. 
Go do it. And you knew. So how do you respond to that temptation to not do what the Spirit told you to do? Here we go. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Be armed with the purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Set your mind to the task. I'm going to suffer. How many of us set our minds to that task? No. Like, oh. I did it the other day, Friday. I said, yeah, it's Friday. Weekend's coming. And then a little voice said, right back there, right about there, you have a sermon to finish. <laughs> oh, okay, no football for me on Saturday. I did get some football, but after I finished the sermon, right? Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Suffering helps you cease from sin. Oh, now not suffering for no purpose, but suffering for the right purpose. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Is your focus living for God? Or is your focus, oh, I have bills to pay, I've got to get this done, I've got my grandkids, I've got my kids, I've got my wife, I've got my brother, I've got... What's your focus? When you start thinking that way, you should automatically, whoa, that's a road sign that says Las Vegas is in the other direction. I think I need to do a U-turn. I need to turn around. I'm not going to Vegas. Oh, I'm off the way. I'm on the wrong road or I'm headed towards the wrong road. I've been trying to... Uh, Oh, let me finish this. I'm sorry. For the time has already passed. Here we go. For the time has already passed. This is key. Is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Remember I said you had to put your, your first and second century Roman Greek hat on? This was actually a problem. Uh, the word... The word immoralities and that word sensuality is the word pornea. And it's not the watered-down version that we have today. You're like, what? That's watered-down? Yeah. The word today is watered-down compared to what it was then. Because it means, literally, to go see the prostitutes or to be a prostitute. Like, whoa. Yeah, that was a problem then. Everybody alive had to walk past at least one house of worship with prostitutes. We're talking Temple of Zeus, Temple of Athena, Temple of whatever, and they all had their temple prostitutes. That's how they made their money. It was a problem. Now, I'm not saying that our normal, normalized 20th, 21st century version of the word porn isn't a problem. It is. But recognize the immorality spiritually think about it whether it's an actual prostitute or its pictures what are you doing whether it's selling your time for a paycheck for a boss you know is telling you you're being immoral or God is telling you you're being immoral to, to fulfill what he or she wants you to do isn't that a form of prostitution you know you're not supposed to do this. Let's just make an outrageous claim. You're dumping toxic waste in the desert. You know it's wrong. But it's your paycheck. I'm just doing my job, God. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to do a different job, you probably should listen to that. That is also pornea. Jesus used that word, that term, also in a figurative way. Don't prostitute yourself. Don't sell yourself short. The drunkenness, the carousing, the drinking parties, the abominable idolatries, all these things of pop culture. In Proverbs it says, don't even let your eyes touch on it. Like, how do I get my eye to touch 
that, well, it's figurative. Your eyes should not even be seeing it. Keep your eyes from it. So, I've been trying to rehabilitate my hip, and uh, one thing that uh, I know for the last eight months, ten months or so, it's just become clear. I haven't, like, gained a whole lot of weight lately, but if I get rid of the weight, three different doctors have told me, <laughs> it'll stop pinching that nerve and I'll be out of pain as much. It's, it won't cause the problem to go entirely away. I'll still have the arthritis. But it's the pinched nerve that's causing the daily pain. So, John, what did I say today about the donuts? I said no. Don't you lie. I said no donuts. <laughs> so I'm confessing my weakness and my sin, and I'm, I'm telling you it's causing me pain. Don't feed me donuts. Okay? Don't feed the bear. But that's everything that we struggle with. We should be that way with every temptation no matter what the temptation is. And yet, we are ashamed. Yet, we don't confess our sins to one another. Yet, we don't enter into communion. Wait, you think I've never been tempted before? <laughs> I've eaten a whole gallon of ice cream by myself. All right? <laughs> oh, what was a... What was your, your gift to John going to be, Jay? Five pounds of M&Ms. There's a story behind it. After one of his more successful track meets, he grabbed a bag of five pound, five pound bag of M&Ms and ate it on the bus on the ride home. Because <laughs> he was just celebrating. And before he knew it, it was gone. So it's not like we don't understand. I understand your failings. I understand your weaknesses. I get it. Let me help you. Let me help you out of the pain and the misery. That's what we should be telling each other. That's what we should be, we should be telling our non-Christian friends. Who's in more pain? Right? They're in more pain than we, uh, we are right now, that's for sure, because we have the hope of a Savior. That's why I love talking to atheists. I love witnessing to atheists because I know exactly where to go. As soon as I, I just wait for it, as soon as I hear, there's always a giveaway. And as soon as I hear that, I'm like, oh, that's causing you pain, isn't it? I'm right there on the, right on the, I'm going to push that button. That hurts, doesn't it? I know. I know the pain that that causes. I understand that pain. They're in pain. Everybody in this room is in pain of some kind or another. Everybody. We all need help with that pain. Don't live for the flesh. Live to help others out of their pain. So, the rest of these verses all fall into one category. Caution, God at work. They're the road signs. Bridge out ahead. If you catch yourself, it's kind of like a Jeff Foxworthy concert or you know, stand-up routine. You might be a Christian if you feel convicted as you walk past the temple prostitutes. You might be a Christian. That's what these verses are for. It's for us to be in communion with God. They're not for us to point out to other people, well, I saw you... Uh, taking a look a little too long at that rated R movie. No. Are you convicted by it? See, Timothy is a great example, right? Remember Timothy? Paul's disciple? Hey, Timothy, I know you got that problem with your stomach. Have a glass of wine. It's like... I prayed, God, let me be like Timothy. Can I have a glass of wine every day? No, it wasn't for me because God knew I'd climb back in the bottle. I got to stay away from the glass of wine every day because it'll be a bottle of whiskey and it'll be two and then I might break out the peppermint schnapps and then I might, yeah, because that's the direction I know. And God has told me, you got to put some boundaries here, dude. 
Don't do that. You almost died. Don't you remember? So for me, that's not helpful. For Timothy, it was. Do I have the awareness? Do I have the recognition of the voice of the Holy Spirit so that I can say, that's not for me, and God said so? Or, that is for me, and God said so. So I'm sorry you're offended. Let's work it out as a Christian. Maybe we can find a way that I don't offend you with it. But God told me I can do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7. Meat sacrificed to idols. Paul went into a long description of how it all works. So these warning signs also tell us something else. Every time we hear the Holy Spirit, He's working. <laughs> right? I hear the question all the time. Well, how do I know? How do I know that wasn't... How do I know the lake of fire isn't for me? Those kinds of questions. Well, you hear the Holy Spirit, don't you? When you read the Bible, it doesn't like set your hands on fire or anything, does it? You understand the words you're reading and you can apply it to your life, right? So these are all signs. God is still working in our life. Here we go. Let's get through it. Ephesians 5.3, immorality, that's that word again, buying and selling with prostitutes. Or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. The takeaway here is you are saints. You're set aside for a purpose. All that other stuff, you've got to remember you're saints. You are polluting the holy name of God by doing the immorality or impurity or the greed. There must be no filthiness or silly talk or coarse jesting with which are not fitting, but rather giving of things. If we catch ourselves, because I catch myself all the time, I like jokes, great sense of humor, sometimes it's not appropriate. Whoops. So then I have to examine my heart. What am I upset about? <laughs> what am I telling God? Yeah, that's, that wasn't enough. I want more. That's what it's for. It's a flashing neon sign saying, Russ, you're not happy with what God has actually given you, are you? Hmm. Yeah, you, you need to have some more gratefulness. Be happy of the hole that God pulled you out of because you're starting to slip back into it. For this you know for certain, with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater, there's that word again, worshiping an image, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Do you like your paycheck? Your spiritual paycheck in heaven? Do you like that? Well, you're just wasting it. I've been a Christian for over 30 years. Do I want to waste it all? That's a pretty big inheritance. You know? I've been teaching for 23 years. That's a pretty big retirement. Do I just want to throw it all away? Cash it in? For the, I think it was worth like $45,000. <laughs> no! I've been working a long time. All they're going to give me if I cash out today is $45,000? That's not worth it. I'll keep working. I'll work until my 30th year, God willing. And then I'll take it. Because then it's worth a whole lot more. Thousands of dollars a month until I die. Why would I take $45,000 now? Well, that's what we do when we start slipping back into those old habits. We're cashing in our inheritance early. And it's not worth it there. So why waste it? Don't waste your inheritance on idolatry. That's weird. My font changed. Hope I can read my notes through that. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So you have three enemies. I've talked about these before. Won't go into depth. You've got the sarks, your sarcophagus. Remember your coffin. Everybody carries a coffin. It looks very similar to my coffin. Your coffin does. Your coffin, your coffin, your coffin. We all have the skin of this coffin. And it's constantly asking, feed me, feed me, watch that movie. Go do that thing, whatever it is. 
It wants to be fed, and it's trying to deceive you. About two years ago, I started talking back to it. Like, really? That's what you want? And then what? Ask that question the next time your flesh rises up and wants you to do that thing, whatever it is. Ask it. And then what? What's going to happen then? So if I walk up and I flirt with that girl, I flirt with that woman over there, what's going to happen? It's going to ruin both of our marriages. It's going to destroy us both. What's going to happen if every night I eat a six-course meal? What's going to happen? What next? If I have that gallon of ice cream, if I have that next donut, thank you, John. What next? Ask yourself that when you're tempted. The so-called friends, they want to get you distracted. Why? Because they want you to join in. Yeah, it's a party. Woohoo! Everybody party down. I need friends to party with. Come on. Party with me. They're trying to distract you. Join in. And the devil, the devil has you in his sights. You realize, when I became a Christian in 1989, the number that identified as said that they were evangelical Christians. You know what it was in 1989? 46%. You know what it is now? Below 35. Lowest level ever in America. Yep. That's why you've got the devil looking at you, because there's fewer of us. It's like, all right, picking them off. Left and right. Got another one. Don't let them pick you off. Have the answer. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. That's the path that he uses. That's the path your flesh uses. That's the path the world, your friends, your worldly friends use. It's always the same. Less the eyes, less the flesh, the pride of life. So now we know. Hey, Shorty's coming right at me. <laughs> right? I know the path they're going to take to try to get me distracted. My job is to avoid it. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't do it. Stand firm. For you were formerly of darkness, but you're now of light. You have a great opportunity. You know the darkness, and you know you were led out of light, or led out of the darkness into the light. Those other people that are walking around without Christ, they don't know the light. You have an opportunity. Take every opportunity. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. We know the goodness. We know the righteousness. We know the truth. And we also know that we learned it in only one way. By making mistakes. We don't always please the Lord. But we tried to learn. We put our hand on the stove. We get burned. We pull it down. So nobody's condemning you if you fall. Nobody's going to condemn you, or shouldn't condemn you, if you miss the road sign. What we should be doing is helping people not miss the road signs, or when they do, turn back around. For it's disgraceful even to speak of things which are done by them in secret. We don't even want to lend them a voice to the filthiness. We don't want to acknowledge that their filthiness has any bearing on becoming a Christian. No, I'm sorry. You can't become a Christian by following those examples. There's only one example, and that's the light. All things become visible when the light exposes it. And that exposure is best left to God's Word and God's timing. When I was a young Christian, I went door to door, like, I'm going to prove evangelism explosion. Hi, I'm here from Assembly God Church. Slam. Because that's what they expected. They just expected to be convicted by what I was going to say. And I learned. It comes through relationships. It comes through a natural outgrowth. I've used this example before. No apple tree 
sticks its branches out, and then grunts, shakes. Come on, Apple! Come on! No. It just grows. All of the crops Jay's harvesting, you're not going to see, see any shaking. You're not going to see any grunting or, gro or hear any grunting or groaning. It just happens. And that should be how we look at helping other non-Christians, others who haven't heard the word. It's a natural outgrowth. It'll just happen. I was sitting there in my classroom a week and a half ago, and a kid comes in and says, you're a Christian, aren't you? Yes, <laughs> I am. What do you need to talk about? And now every single day he's come in my room that exact same time in the morning and asked me about things in the Bible. I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't go out and say, all right, you're my next victim. Come on. <laughs> no, it just happened. I didn't ask him to come in. There was no conversation in the middle of class or anything. It just happened. He said, I got some questions about the Bible. All right. Yes. Let's talk about it. For this reason. What, did I miss one? Do, 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 do. No. Okay. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We are to be helping those that fell asleep in Christ. We are to be helping those that never knew Christ. Wake up. Wake up. We all fall asleep. It's okay. You remember the story in Acts? The guy fell out of the third story window and died. Paul didn't kick him and say, you stupid idiot, after he was brought back to life. He went back to preaching. He came down. God said to lay on him and he would come back to life. Okay, I'll do that. God said, he, Paul probably asked, okay, what next? Holy Spirit said, go back to preaching. Okay. And he went back to preaching. That was it. That should be our attitude. We shouldn't be condemning people that fell asleep. Making the most... Whoops, wrong direction. No, I was the right direction. What did I do? I got out of... Therefore, be careful how you... Oh, I did say the most of your time because the days are evil. No. What happened here? I don't know. I'm one off. There we go. My, my, my 18th century technology is ahead of my 21st. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. That goes back to Timothy. There are certain things that you're going to be told to do that's okay for you and not others. Be wise. Don't be unwise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. That, that phrase, making the most of your time, it actually means rescue every opportunity. Run into the fire and grab that opportunity out when you see it. If you're just walking along in your day and you see an opportunity, rescue it. I don't know if you remember the story I told you about my friend that I saw up in Boise. Hanging out with him for like two hours and I just waited and I waited and I waited to bring back Jesus into his life because I know he's been told once before and then the opportunity happened but it was his wife that actually asked. So okay. I waited for the opportunity. I knew it would happen. Not exactly the way I thought it would. But are you rescuing every opportunity, making the most of your time? So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Mimic? Follow? Be a mime? Do not be an idolater? Right? He gives you both the positive and the negative here in Ephesians 5. He says, follow Christ. Don't be an idolater. The good and the bad side. And here's verse 19. I love this one. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's why as soon as I heard the story this morning by Art, I'm like, yes, that's it. That'll be perfect for this slide. That was a melody. That was a song. That was a hallelujah. Yes. The angels are rejoicing because a sinner turned his heart back towards God and God received him into heaven. Those are the spiritual songs it's talking about here. 
It's not the latest, I don't know, Lincoln Brewster or, you know, Maranatha praise and worship or going way back to Gaither Band. It's not those. Those are songs, but that's not a spiritual song. The spiritual song are the encouragements we give to each other. Like when I said I had a student come in. We should all be rejoicing. You get an amen? Amen. Yeah. Come on. I'm like, whoo, yeah. Got another one coming in. Maybe he'll want to be baptized here too. That'd be awesome. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to our God and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. I want to go back to that, always giving thanks. That phrase in the Greek is the word Eucharist. Yeah, that little thing that we do once a month. The Eucharist. Wait a minute. That word is communion in English. Eucharist is a Greek word. To be part of a community. To share one another's burdens. That's what the Eucharist means. In the fear of Christ. Going back to Jeremiah. As I've told many of you before, you know, I didn't have a father growing up. And so when I read verses like this, I love Jeremiah. I spent a lot of time in Jeremiah as a young Christian. And I remember reading verses over and over that said, I will be your God. And that translated in my mind, I will be the father you never had. I will be the replacement father that left you when you were three years old. I will be the father that that evil stepdad should have been to you. I will be the perfect father. I will be your God. And not only that, you're going to be my son. And everything that goes along with being the son of a God, the son of the God, the son of Jehovah, you now carry the name Jehovah. I wanted to rename myself Russ Jehovah. <laughs> I was like, how could I do this? Uh, that's too much trouble. Too much trouble. I actually thought about it because I took it that personal as a message from the Scripture to me. And then, they will all know me. Like, I get a bonus? I get the Holy Spirit. Yes! <laughs> like, wow! Now, five months later, in the middle of track season, when I'm feeling like quitting, and the Holy Spirit is telling me, don't you dare quit. You have a purpose on this track team. I'm like, okay, God, can I quit at the end of the season? Because I really, I really don't like this. This is a lot of work. And God said, no. No, you're going to rehab that hamstring you tore, and you're going to come back next year, and you're going to be a witness to those people on the track team again. So I got through my sophomore year. I'm like, all right, can I, can I quit now, please? This is all worldly. This is all stupid stuff. I don't know why I'm competing. I don't know why I'm running. I don't... God said, no, you're coming back for your junior year too. I'm like, really? Yeah. And my senior year, even though it was worldly, even though I had to listen to their messed up versions of reality. Let's just leave it there. I'm not even going to give words to what they did. <laughs> it's pretty gross. It's like, I got to put up with this, God? Not only do you have to put up with it, you have to witness to them. You have to show them the reflection of Christ and of love. You have to learn to not judge them. And you have to show them that they're forgiven too, if they want it. Okay, God. Most torturous four years of my life. Because I could see that they were causing themselves and others. And yet, none of them wanted to hear it. But God set me there. 
So I was faithful, did what I was told. Finally, in Galatians, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's the biggest warning sign of them all. It's pretty obvious we know it when we're in the flesh. We know. You start to bite back at somebody, or you catch yourself in that rut that you thought you'd left 25, 35 years ago, whatever. It's obvious when we're in the flesh. And that's the biggest flashing sign saying, hey, come back to communion. Take a bite of Eucharist, right? Find that communion with God again because that's where it's at. Not in man-made things, but in the Holy Spirit. Not in things that we can see and we can bring service to. No, that's not it. Coming through those doors, that's not it. Having communion with Christ. That's where it's at. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for all the warning signs you give to us. Thank you for the road signs you give to us. Thank you for the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit that we have, guiding us and leading us, telling us what to say and what to do. And thank you for the final chapter being written in our name for us. We will see you in the new Jerusalem in all your shining glory and we will get to be a part of that great crowd, that awesome throng, that, that mighty assembly all declaring holy, holy, holy is the Lamb the Lord God Almighty, worthy is He. Lord, help us to remember that every day, every hour. Remind us, bring people across our paths, bring people's names to mind. Help us to focus on your eternal instruction to follow you, to be a mime, to mimites, your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Where you go.